If you want to learn more about design patterns, you came to the right place. In this video, we're going to explore three creational design patterns that I think any programmer should know. But first, let's see what are design patterns. In simple terms, design patterns are solutions or techniques to avoid co-design problems. They were developed by the industry during years of handling wrong decisions and were described in that famous computer science book that I recommend, whose authors are known as the Gang of Four. Now, according to that book, there are three categories of design patterns. Creational patterns that are dealing with the code that creates objects. Behavioral patterns that are concerned with structuring the communication between different entities. And structural patterns which establish the way different components interact with each other. In this video, we'll talk about creational design patterns, but make sure to subscribe to the channel because there are two upcoming videos on structural and behavioral patterns. Before diving into the actual content, I want to quickly emphasize three main reasons why you should know design patterns. First, they help you design code that is more robust and extensible, which is a very valuable skill for any software engineer. Secondly, they help you understand new code easily if it follows a pattern that you already know, so you will spend less time ramping up with a new codebase. And lastly, design patterns help you improve the communication with other programmers because they are considered general knowledge in the industry so it would be easy to express different ideas around a pattern that is already known. For each design pattern we're gonna talk about in this video and in the upcoming ones, we'll cover the following key points that I believe are essential to understand how the pattern works. First, we'll understand the general overview of the pattern, what is the main idea behind it, the design problem that led to the creation of the pattern, the solution for that problem, and finally, we'll go through a real example to see how the pattern works. I believe that explaining those patterns in a visual way will definitely make you understand them better than just seeing an UML diagram with them, so let's dive in. The first pattern we're gonna talk about is called Singleton and it's the simplest one to understand and also to remember. The main idea behind it is to ensure, or to enforce actually, that a single object of a particular class can be created. Now you may probably wonder why would we ever need that kind of behavior in an application. Well actually, this is helpful when you get some classes that have an application-wide behavior. For example, user manager should be a class that deals with user's management, so you would likely want to have a single instance of that throughout your app. Another example would be a class that is named app config, which should hold the configuration for the entire application. Another example would be a class called logger, which takes care of the application logging mechanism. You would likely want to have a single instance of that instead of creating one for each other class that uses it. To ensure that a single instance of a particular class can be created, you need to mark its default constructor as private and also want to make sure that there are no other constructors with parameters. The unique instance of that class should be stored somewhere and the only way to ensure its uniqueness is to keep it inside the class itself as a static private field. And of course, to be able to access it from the outside, we need to create a public static method that returns the instance. This is the most simplistic version of the singleton class that you may encounter and in most cases this version is fair enough to deal with. To use it, you just have to call the getInstance method to retrieve the unique instance. However, there are some optimizations that we can apply on it. First, notice that we are initializing the instance directly which happens when the application starts or more exactly when the class is loaded by the JVM. We can improve that by moving the initialization step to the getInstance method so that we can create the instance only when we need it and not all the time when a class is loaded. This is called lazy initialization. Now, what if you're using that singleton class in a multi-threaded context? Or in other words, what if multiple threads are calling the getInstance method concurrently? This code is exposed to a race condition where multiple instances of the same class can be created by different threads. And to avoid that, we need to use a synchronization block to ensure exclusive access to the method that creates the instance. But we can do even better than that. If we store the instance into a static class inside our main singleton class, a very interesting thing will happen. When we start the application, the JVM will load only the outer class without creating the instance. And when we call the getInstance method, the inner static class will be initialized and the singleton instance will be created. So we got that lazy initialization feature but we also got a thread safety because the Java memory model ensures the fact that the class loading is performed sequentially. 
That's a very elegant form of singleton, which is known as initialization on demand holder idea. So that's pretty much all about singleton pattern. There is one last thing that needs to be mentioned, however. This pattern should be used with extra caution because by its nature, it generates a global state of a system, which may go against the object-oriented principles if it's used extensively. The next pattern I think it's really important to know is called Builder. The design problem behind that pattern is the following. Imagine you have a class with many many fields and you constantly create some objects that only use some of those fields. One visible effect of that is the creation of multiple constructors for that class, each one with a different set of fields. This is known as a telescopic constructor effect and in the long term it leads to a badly designed code base with limited extensibility. The solution this pattern proposes is to take the big class that you have, grab all setter methods of it, or create them if they are not there, and create an interface out of them. The role of that interface is to provide a specification that you need to follow to be able to create an object of your big class. Now, using that interface, you create specific builder classes which implement the wrong creation logic for that class, so you need to identify all object variations that you have and create a builder class for each one of them. To actually call the builders and get the object, you need to create a class that is called a director, according to the pattern. This class is essentially just an abstract middleware that calls the builder to create the object. As you can see, it doesn't know anything about the specific builder, it only knows about the builder interface, so if you add new specific builders, this class remains untouched. Now the client code invokes the director class to get the created object, but it also needs to specify the builder, the concrete builder, that should be used for that. So in other words, the client says to the director, Hey director, please create that object for me using that specific builder. Now let's take a more realistic example to see how this pattern really works. Let's imagine we have a web application that manages two types of users, the ones that log in on our website and the ones that just visit our website without logging in. Let's call them unauthenticated users. Let's suppose that a user is managed through a user class that looks like that. We just store the first and the last name the authentication state, which is true or false depending on whether the user is logged in or not, and the cookie ID, which is just an identifier stored on the user's browser. For authenticated users, we want to build a user object that contains values for all the fields, and the authenticated state will be set on true because the user is authenticated. For unauthenticated users, we won't have a first name or a last name, so we'll just set a default value for them. The authentication state will be on false, and let's assume that it has a cookie stored on its browser, so we should also set that field. Now let's apply the builder pattern for that use case. Let's add the setter methods for this class, and with them, let's create a user builder interface. Notice that we also added a new method on that interface that will use to retrieve the user object that is constructed. We have two variations for the user object authenticated and unauthenticated, so we'll create two specific builder classes, one for each variation. Let's see how the class for the authenticated case looks like. As you can see, we have a user object that we're going to construct, and we set the first name and the last name, the authentication state is true, and finally we return the created user on the getUser method. For the unauthenticated case, the first name and the last name will have some default values because the user is not logged in on our website, and the authentication state is set on false. Now let's create a director class which we'll call user manager. Notice that here we work with the user builder interface and not with a specific builder instance. We also have the method construct user that we use to call the provider builder and return the created object. The values for all the fields can be retrieved from an external component like a UI component or they can be passed by the client code. Now finally, the client code will just have to create an instance of the specific builder it wants to use and it should instantiate the user manager with that builder and then retrieve the constructed user object. As you can see, it's pretty easy for the client to select a different object variation. You just have to pass in a different specific builder. Those are all the components we need to implement the builder pattern on that example. It really increases the codebase size, but instead it leads to a more robust and extensible code. Now let's move on to the last creational design pattern we're going to talk about in this video. 
This one is called Abstract Factory and despite its complex sounding name, you'll see that its main idea is pretty simple to understand. Let's imagine we have a group of objects that are specified in an abstract way and we want to create them together in different contexts. So for each context, we want to build the same objects, but adapted to the context they belong to. As a quick example, let's say we want to build some UI controls like a checkbox or a button, and we want to create them for different operating systems. They are essentially the same UI controls, but they look different in each operating system. So when we create them, we need to be ensured by the class hierarchy that they belong to the same operating system. Let's take a more in-depth example to see this in action. Let's say we want to build an application that manages two completely different stores. One store sells vegetables and another one sells auto parts. They both need employees and products. Remember that here we are talking about products and employees in an abstract way, so they are specified by interfaces as we'll see in a second. Now the idea is that whenever we want to work with those two types of objects, we want to make sure they belong to the same store. Here's the specification for the products and employees, and the key part of this pattern is to abstract both factories to a common interface that we call store factory in that case. Now of course, specific factories will implement that interface and they will contain their own logic for creating the objects. The client will just create a specific factory it needs and it will call the factory methods to create the products and employee objects. But the biggest advantage is that it can manage the concrete factories through the store factory interface. So if it decides to change the specific factory, the downstream call will not have to change, as long as it's based on the store factory interface. That's the real power of that design pattern. It guarantees that when you create employees and products, they always belong to the same type of store. And also you can change the underlying implementation without invalidating the client code. And those were the three creational design patterns I believe any software engineer should know. If you want to check the code, there's a link in the description for that. I really hope you found that video useful and don't forget to subscribe because more incredible content is on the way.